My, my paper looks at um, <coughs> export spillovers, and the idea is to find out if domestic farms learn from foreign owned farms in both Kenya and Malaysia. And my out, the outline of my presentation takes uh, that approach. I start by giving the motivation, then the research objectives, uh, the results, uh, data, and how I do the estimations. Uh, in terms of the motivation, um, I start by noting that these two countries have, they share more or less a similar history because after independence, they, were, uh, <coughs> they obtained independence from, from the British. Then they adopted similar uh, development strategies uh, immediately after, after independence. Um, um, and, um, but, but at the same time, they, are also, they also have many, many, many differences. Uh, and one of, one of the differences, of course, has to do with the initial conditions. That it's possible to argue that the initial conditions at independence were not, were not the same, and therefore there's no need for comparison. But a more compelling reason why this comparison is necessary is because um, after 2002, when in Kenya, when the new government took, took over power, uh, the elites uh, started developing a lot of interest on what was happening in Southeast Asia. And Malaysia was one of the countries that uh, Kenyans tend to compare themselves with. The argument is, of course, is that in the 60s they were doing better than Malaysia, but all of a sudden Malaysia has been able to industrialize, and Kenya <coughs> has, had, has experienced stagnated growth over the years. Um, so what, what has happened is that, as a result, uh, there have been... Uh, a lot of engagements uh, between the two governments where Kenyans have gone to Malaysia to try and learn how they have been able to, uh, to how they were able to industrialize. And um, one of the if, uh, fruits or the, the, the outcomes of this collaboration has been, was the establishment of the free trade zones uh, after, after in, in Kenya, after the Penang model in, in Malaysia. There was the establishment of the Kenya National Economic Social Council, which oversees the, you know, the, the development of the country through the implementation of Vision 2030, which uh, collaborates with um, the National uh, Economic Action Council in Malaysia. And Vision 2030 was also developed after, after <coughs> Malaysia's Vision 2020. So there is a lot of interest on what is happening in Malaysia, and therefore this, um, so in the process of learning, I thought with this kind of comparison, our, our our policymakers can learn something about what happened in the manufacturing sector in Malaysia over the years. Now, one of the arguments in literature is that the reason why Malaysia has been able to do very well has to do with uh, their ability to not only attract foreign direct investment, but also to use it, to use it in a productive manner. Uh, so, and, and scholars like uh, Jomo Rashia have, 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 have talked about that. And FDI was mainly uh, went to the to, to the non-resource resource-rich sectors, and it was mainly export-driven, starting from the 70s. Um, so Kenya has also managed to attract um, FDI, but for some reason Kenya has not been able to. The argument is that Kenya has not been able to take advantage of the FDI benefits, and therefore the manufacturing sector has has stagnated. Now, when you think about FDI and the benefits that can accrue from FDI, um, my study focuses on the indirect effects and export spillovers, one of them. And according to uh, Bloomstone and Coco, the definition is uh, these are the benefits that would accrue to domestic farms in host countries uh, through foreign-owned farms export operations and which may pave way um, for local farms to enter the same export market. So there is a lot of learning that takes place so that foreign farms can also be able to start uh, joining the market. And this may be because of probably in, in transport infrastructure or information that these farms get to know about uh, new, new export markets uh, as a result of interacting with um, um, uh, foreign-owned farms. Now, the, what, what has happened in literature which of course, is one of the, or the, what would be one of the contributions in this paper is that most of the studies that have looked at this issue tend to use uh, random effects, um, where, where you know the, <coughs> where they estimate a probit model, and um, which captures the decision of farms to to export. So farm, farms' decision to export. So it's either zero or one. The only problem with 
This model, uh, probit estimations, is that you can't do um, you can't do the fixed effects estimations because of the incidental parameter problem. So what we try to do in this paper is we use a linear probability fixed effects model to uh, to 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 do our estimations because, of course, once we do random effects model, you you tend to ignore the, the individual uh, specific effects. Um, then, of course, for these two countries, um, there is very limited literature uh, and studies done in this area. So it, it was also one of the comparing reasons why we looked at this. Now, so we go to the research questions. The first one, then, is uh, do foreign farms influence the learning to export by domestic farms in Kenya and Malaysia? And yes, what are the transmission channels? Again, a lot of literature does not look at the transmission channels, so we also uh, take advantage of the data set we have to look at the, the transmission channels. Now, I start by giving the results, and uh, the main result is that uh, we find very limited evidence of export spillovers in Kenya from foreign direct investment. Uh, this, um, well, this was to a large extent surprising because Kenya has a reasonable level of FDI in Kenya and FDI tend to be very vocal. So you'd expect that um, because of the, heavy, of the presence of FDI for a long time, they had, the learning also have been taking place. But based on our estimations, there is very limited evidence of, of, of learning. Then the next thing that we see is that in Malaysia, indeed, there is evidence of export spillovers. Um, and these positive spillovers are mainly through backward linkages. But you also have um, negative spillovers from uh, what I'm referring to, competition and information channels. Um, now, I will, I will discuss how I do the estimations and, and, how, and, and the proxies that I use for, for that in, uh, as we progress. Then what you see is that in Malaysia is that the concentration of these spillovers, the negative spillovers, is actually in farms that have low productivity. So it is the farms that, that, that struggle, really, that, um, that end up ex having, um, suffering from the presence of, of, of F, from FDI. Now, we, we also find that uh, this was a, rob a robustness um, test. So we tried to find out if indeed it, the relationship can also be the other way around, that you can have uh, domestic farms or foreign-owned farms learning from domestic farms, and we, find, we do not find evidence of that. So indeed, uh, the learning effect takes place from foreign direct investment to domestic farms and not the other way around. Now, we also try to speculate, although the paper does not really look at why this is, um, why we have this kind of effects, spillovers. One of the reasons why we have uh, positive spillovers in Malaysia, we attribute that to the labor content requirements, which, were in, which have been enforced for quite some time, and therefore, it seems like that kind of policy has paid off. And in Kenya, we do not have, we do not have this. Uh, so, in terms of the data that we use, we, we obtained some data from, in Kenya from the Ministry of Industrialization. Um, the government used to collect this data a while back, but after 2005, they stopped collecting the data. Uh, so we were, able, we were fortunate enough to get um, a good sample of farms, for it, both foreign farms and domestic farms. Um, then in Malaysia, again, the data set we had was from 2000 up to 2006. Again, after 2006, the Malaysian government stopped collecting, um, they stopped releasing this, this data. So I was fortunate enough when I was, when I was doing the study to access this data set. And what you see from, from, from this, although most of the details are in the paper, what you see from this is that um, the number of farms in Malaysia is way much more than, than in Kenya. So there has been a lot of growth over the years. Uh, but then we also have a reasonable number of foreign farms and local farms in both countries. So in terms of uh, the variables that I consider, um, I will focus mainly on the spillover variables. We have um, RDF, uh, this one RDF, which, is, which captures demonstration effects. And this is defined as the share of expenditure by foreign farms in each sector over uh, the total expenditure of R&D in that sector. 
Um, then we have, we have the, um, the, the competition uh, effects proxy, which is the ratio of foreign owned firms share in employment in a sector to employment in the sector. Um, and the idea here is that if this, this will give us the importance or the significance of the foreign sector in the domestic market. So if the sector is, um, if, if, the, um, um, if the sector is very important, then you'd expect competition uh, pressures um, going to the domestic farms. Um, then we also have uh, FEX, which is um, the proxy for uh, um, import information spillovers, I mean information channels, which is captured by the ratio of foreign owned farms in export sectors to total exports in sector J. Now the idea here is that uh, we're, lo we're looking at the export activity. So if, if domestic farms are in sectors that have a high um, um, concentration of foreign owned farms engaged in export activity, then you expect that um, they will tend to learn in the process. Then we also have the last proxy of, um, of, of um, uh, the spillovers, which is um, the domestic, um, the which is um, for backward linkages, and that is a share of the cost of uh, direct raw material sourced from domestic farms by foreign owned, uh, by foreign farms in a sector to the total cost of the direct raw materials. Uh, so that captures um, the backward linkages. So, and then of course we use the other, the other variables. We have other variables that we have, control variables that we use. Um, how do we do the estimations? Uh, well. I think it's okay, fine. So the empirical strategy that we follow is that we first estimate the determinants of farms' decision to export in both countries. So for all the farms, then secondly, we look at we do another estimation to find out whether foreign owned farms affect the decision of domestic farms to export and through which channels. And then lastly, we interact productivity measure with the spillover variables to try and see whether, to try and see um, if, because the literature suggests that the most productive farms could easily get into the export market, and therefore you'd expect them to have a high concentration of spillovers. And, and lastly, we, for, the, for the robustness test, we, we, we estimate um, whether indeed the relationship can, can be the reverse, so whether domestic farms would influence foreign owned farms. And Chair, I would wish to stop here and thank you very much for your attention.